Hi everybody, Dr. Mike here. It's time to talk metabolism. So you know the three major macronutrients, proteins, fats, carbohydrates, what happens when you ingest them. Let's have a look. So you take in a burger, you take a bite, you chew it up, you break it down, you get those proteins, fats, and carbs in your stomach, which then are further digested once they get into your intestines. So now we have proteins, we've got fats being triglycerides, we have carbs being sugars here. Now your intestines are gonna further break these components down into their micronutrients. So that means proteins will break down into amino acids, sugars will break down predominantly into glucose, and triglycerides will break down into glycerol and fatty acids. From the intestines, they will then get absorbed into what's called the portal vein. The portal vein is a blood system that takes all these nutrients from the intestines directly to the liver for processing, okay? Now what you can find is that the amino acids, glucose, glycerol and fatty acids all get taken via the portal vein to the liver, so this is a liver cell here, but triglycerides as glycerol and fatty acids actually get absorbed into the lymphatic system. Now the lymphatic system will then send glycerol and fatty acids as triglycerides into the systemic circulation. This is the bloodstream that actually goes to the entire body. So that means unlike proteins and carbs, fats will actually be delivered to the entire body prior before them go into the liver. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Okay, now let's just say the amino acids have now been absorbed or taken from the portal vein into the liver, glucose into the liver, glycerol and fatty acids into the liver. What happens? Well, if we've just eaten a meal, the idea is that the body wants to store these products. So we can store amino acids as proteins, we can store glucose as something called glycogen. Remember, if you read a biological term and it ends in O-G-E-N, it means stored and inactive and it can store glycerol and fatty acids as triglycerides or fat. All right, easy. Now, what if we wanna use these substances? Well, mainly we wanna do it to produce energy. Energy being ATP. How does this work? Well, okay, let's first look at glucose because this is our primary energy source in the body. Glucose will be turned into something called pyruvate. Pyruvate will jump into the mitochondria and turn into something called acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA goes through this cycle called the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle. And as it goes through this cycle and turns into a number of products, it releases carbon dioxide as a waste product, but also releases ATP. Bang, we've created some energy. We also create a small amount of ATP when we turn glucose into pyruvate, but not too much. Now, as we turn this acetyl-CoA into energy, it releases some hydrogen. Now hydrogen, remember hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium of the periodic table, hydrogen will travel to the membrane of the mitochondria. Remember the mitochondria being the powerhouse, why? Because of this whole process here. The hydrogen jumps into the membrane where it starts talking with a number of proteins embedded in the membrane. Now with oxygen, so you need hydrogen and oxygen coming together with these transmembrane proteins and it produces ATP. This is called oxidative phosphorylation. This is the electron transport chain, okay? So with this process here, we create huge amounts of ATP, around about 30 to 32, uh, 32 to 36 ATP molecules. Okay, what if we don't have any oxygen, for example? So if we're going for a jog, this process is fine, but let's just say we're doing a 100 meter sprint, okay? Where we need more ATP than oxygen we can get in. That means this process is going crazy, producing all these hydrogen, but we don't have enough oxygen. Oxygen is the rate limiting step here. So this starts to backlog. So what ends up happening is that the pyruvate turns into something called lactic acid. Lactic acid doesn't need oxygen to be produced and lactic acid can form ATP. That's why after intensive bouts of usually anaerobic exercise, not requiring oxygen, you get that lactic acid, all right? Okay, what else can happen? Well, the triglycerides that are broken up into glycerol and fatty acids, glycerol can jump into this glucose chain here at the level of pyruvate. This is perfect. Fatty acids can jump into this gl uh, glucose metabolism down at acetyl-CoA. Important point is that once it hits pyruvate, it can turn back into glucose if need be. But once it's gone past pyruvate into acetyl-CoA, it cannot go backwards. Now this is important because if we don't have any glucose in the system, we start to break down triglycerides for energy. The glycerol jumps in here at the level of pyruvate, Wonderful. Fatty acids jump in here, the level of acetyl-CoA. Wonderful. We start producing ATP. But what happens is, because we don't have any glucose, we want to replenish those stores. And oxaloacetate here jumps back and turns into glucose. Pyruvate jumps back and turns into glucose. But 
all these fatty acids are coming down at the level of acetyl-CoA, so we start to produce too much acetyl-CoA. So the acetyl-CoA starts to back up, back up, back up, and produce something called ketones. Ketones are the beta-hydroxybutyrate, right? Acetoacetone, uh, these are the ketones. They can turn into ATP. Perfect. Okay, this is basically the entire system when it comes to metabolism. Now, obviously, I've missed out on a couple of processes, but this is the metabolic processes of proteins, fats, and carbohydrates.